Welcome, everybody, to this week's May Checks It discussion group call for Tactical Sovereignty. Beautiful Sunday, the first day of the week. Not the seventh, and not the Sabbath, like I always say. But welcome aboard our non maritime ship anyway. Um, just having a interesting week down here in Southwest Florida, or on Southwest Florida, rather. With all of the um, activities going on, people trying to get things back to normal after the storm. Unfortunately, after something like this occurs, it's not like you just turn the lights back on and everybody resumes life like normal because it takes quite a while for things to uh, get back to whatever might even be considered to be normal. Or at least uh, normal for the uh, inhabitants or denizens or citizens, whatever you want to call them. But a lot of rebuilding to be done, a lot of roofs to patch, roads to clear, businesses to get reopened again, and that kind of thing. Especially when a lot of people's inventory is destroyed in these storms, makes it kind of difficult to get your business up and rolling again. And especially with the situation with shipping the past year and a half or so. And it's been quite a slowdown, especially if you're dependent on getting product from other countries for your business. People are having problems with that. Uh, I think a lot of people have noticed that, especially when it comes to maybe getting auto repairs done, things of that nature. It's very difficult. I had somebody today uh, asking a question about purchasing property. How did I do it? And so it was less than an hour before we started this up tonight. So I recommended to them to come on and join us. And I would have a chat with them and go through it. There's a lot of things people don't realize you just can't cover in the text on social media. Or there's, you know, some background information on different things that you have to know in order to wrap your mind around some of these ideas because it's not quite as simple as, you know, people think. Everybody's been shown the basic way of doing things, the way they want all the slaves to do stuff, and so that's pretty much all anybody knows. But as far as thinking outside the box and using some alternative methods, especially when it comes to purchasing property, a lot of that has kind of fallen by the wayside or disappeared into the annals of history because everybody's so used to just using the USD or the Federal Reserve note, things like that. And so one person had commented to them, and uh, let me see if I can remember what they said. Um, they said to use a land grant, land grant patent. Told me right off the get that person has absolutely no clue what they're even talking about, and they've obviously never done anything like this because those are two different processes wrapped up into one the grant and the patent, two totally different things. Um, grant, I don't know where anybody's going to get a grant from nowadays because grants are handed down by a sovereign or a king or a government, that's where your grant comes from. And I haven't heard of too many land grants in recent history. And land patents, uh, I know there is a gentleman by the name of Gibson. I believe he's the one that teaches about patents, uh, although that's even very archaic as well. Um, in recent history, there were two states in the USA, actually, that did it. I'm thinking it was... Nevada and Texas, if I remember correctly. And either one or both of them no longer do it anymore. So um, those things have kind of gone away as well. But, but the, the only thing that really remains that, that can be used that's beneficial is what you're using to purchase property with. And... When I say property, I'm not talking just real property like land, but property even like um, your vehicle. Your vehicle is your property. 
There's a lot of things that are your property. Your rights are your property. Um, so property doesn't only cover just tangible items, but also covers intangible items as well. And like I said, when it comes down to what you use, I think that today is probably the most important aspect to tackle things from. That, that's one of the reasons why a lot of these alternative coins like Bitcoin or Ethereum or you know, whatever other type of cryptocurrency were gaining a, a lot of uh, a lot of following. A lot of people were really liking the idea, and especially the people that comprehend jurisdiction, because the jurisdiction of the U.S. really falls on the coin of the realm, falls on the Federal Reserve note. So when you were using other methods such as cryptocurrency, uh, then the course we're having a problem with jurisdiction. And I had even heard several judges question it and frankly say they weren't really sure if they had jurisdiction over the issue because of the type of currency that was being used. And you'll hear a lot of people yell and scream when it comes to money. They'll say, oh, there's no such thing as money. You know, money is only gold and silver. Well, that type of thought strictly stems uh, not from just medieval times, but from the Constitution of the United States. Because in that, it also says that money shall be gold and silver. So you know, for some people, it won't want for some reason, people think that uh, they're going to follow the Constitution as far as knowing what's legitimate in their life and what's not. Um, if that is what somebody is following, if they're just following the Constitution, then they will have a very, very limited existence. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, the, the Constitution was really for the running of a company and how that company well, it was going to conduct its affairs. Um, it was broken down into parts that covered, you know, essentially nothing about society, but it, it did cover money, it covered judiciary, it covered uh, the government, and uh, like I said, the courts as well. And, and so it didn't really get into what your real rights are or anything like that. There's no such thing as constitutional rights. The Constitution doesn't list any rights. And if you're going to rely on just the Bill of Rights for your rights, then, like I said, once again, you're going to have a pretty limited existence. So when it comes to the currency that's being used, as you see, this was something I looked at a few years ago. And I'm always looking for, you know, that, that linchpin or that hook between us and the state. Um, where is this beast known as jurisdiction uh, roaring its head from? Uh, when do you see it arise? And, and looking at different people who get in trouble for doing different things, uh, whether you're looking at like the Winston Shrouds or Turner or some of those types of people, they always have one thing in common, is that they messed with the coin of the realm. And so when you're messing with the coin of the realm, yeah, that, that's where you end up kind of getting in trouble at. And so to me, that was a sign that, of course, it must have been about the jurisdiction. That's what the coin of the realm was really all about. Because that's where they seem to, you know, roar that ugly head of jurisdiction where you always see it pop up at. And in playing around with that, I, I did it with some properties such as an auto purchase. And a, a lot of people will say, well, how do you purchase it with silver or gold? You know? And, you know, it, I always recommend staying in honor and doing things the honest way. And when you're negotiating the sale with the person, you're just going to tell them, you know, um, the amount that you want is equivalent to X amount of silver or X amount of gold, and that's what I'm going to pay you in. And that's what's going to be written on the bill of sale. Now, if you're not comfortable afterwards with holding that gold or silver, 
I'll just purchase it back from you. And that's one way you can stay honest in the whole situation. So you can do it that way. And for the state of Florida, I know it is illegal to have an unregistered vehicle in your driveway. Everything's got to be tagged and plated, registered, and all that. And so when you go and do a purchase for a vehicle at the Department of Motor Vehicles, you're going to start out with doing the transfer of the title. After you do the transfer of the title, they just immediately walk you right into whose name is this going to be registered in, what kind of plates would you like to have, those basic elements. Well, I have done two purchases like this now, and this is the way they both went. Uh, when they asked how much the vehicle was purchased for, because that gets written down onto that title as well. And uh, that's also going to determine a uh, tax that you have to pay. And that right there is your lunch pen. That's your jurisdiction. Because they're determining the tax that's going to be paid according to how much you purchased the vehicle for. So when I told them that the vehicle was purchased for a certain sum of silver, I remember the clerk kind of sat back on her chair and looked up in the air and thought, well, I guess I'll list this as a gift. Um, so she listed it as a gift. And afterwards, she gave me the hard copy of the new title and said, have a good day. And there was never a mention of registration, license plates, anything like that. Because they didn't have jurisdiction to enforce that because the sale was not done with, you know, the coin of the realm wasn't done with the federal reserve note or USD United States dollar. And I have a friend that I, I had gone over this information with several years ago. He's been doing the same thing with the purchase of um, real estate or with land rather. And the same thing happens there as well. And, and that's really the best way to purchase anything. It's with gold or silver. And then on top of that, again, I would say the best way to also continue with that purchase of, say, land is that you don't register the deed. And a lot of people want to get into the argument of over recording or registering or da da da, whatever. I, I really don't care about any of that. I'm just focusing in on the registration process of the deed law. Because I know there's been a, a numerous people that um, have had success and gone after the aspect, for instance, of not having property taxes liable to the owner. And how to go about that. And it was, for most of them, chasing down all of the numerous statutes in whatever state you're on, presenting those to the tax assessor, and then crossing your fingers and hoping to get either a phone call or a letter from him within the next day or two, letting you know that the property had been removed from the tax rolls. And they had been having good success with doing that. However... I saw that as a little bit of a uh, pain in the butt. And a lot of people don't have the time for all of that. And I think with any situation that people are having problems with, uh, say, for instance, uh, Department of Children and Families, those kind of issues as well. It, people by now, I would hope, know that one of the first things you want to do is to go and look up the charter or for those organizations. And uh, the charter is what established them by the state. And within that charter, it will list what their role is, what their job is. And you can see as well, whether or not they are stepping outside the scope of what their job responsibility is. So I did the same thing really with, with the old tax issue and that is, I knew that because my father had been a tax assessor or a property appraiser, whatever you want to call him, and go and look up the job title for 
a tax assessor. And I, I found it to be really kind of like a concurrent, no matter where you're looking at, what state you're looking at. They, they all said essentially the same thing. And what they all basically boiled down to was that the role of the tax assessor was to assess taxes on all registered deeds. Pretty short and sweet. So right in there lies the remedy for that, or not even remedy. I prefer to go for cure. Everybody wants remedy. Remedy is only the second step. You know, if you're looking at, say, for instance, maritime law, well, you've got salvage, remedy, and cure. Well, why stop at remedy? Go for the cure. Let's go all the way with it. That's the way I look at it. And so when you see the tax assessor's job title, his responsibility is to assess taxes on all registered deeds. Well, there's your answer. You don't register the deed. If there is no registered deed for the property you've purchased, then there is nothing for him to assess taxes on. It's really that simple. And then, of course, a lot of people will go, oh, well, you have to register your deed. Actually, no, you don't. That is something that is totally voluntary. Just about everything is voluntary. People don't even realize that. And if you look up the registration of deeds and the reason why people register deeds, it's really pretty simple. It's so that when it comes time for them to make another transaction with that property, uh, say to sell it again, then the purchaser can um, have a title company do a title search on that property and be able to track you know, who's owned it, whether there's any money owed, if there's liens, and that sort of thing. So essentially, you buy the property, you don't register the deed unless you plan on selling it. If you plan on selling it, Within the next month or two, well, then, you know, take your happy butt down to the courthouse land records and register the deed. Uh, that way it can be uh, tracked as far as ownership goes and as far as any outstanding debts that may or may not exist. Uh, which, of course, if there's no registered deed for all that time, however long you owned it, during that period of time, there's not going to be any liens or anything attached to it. It's not possible because it doesn't exist in their records. It, it, pretty cut and dried, very simple. And, and it's so many of the things that I would rather label as a cure rather than a remedy are simple. Uh, the problem is people want the more complicated steps. For some reason, they, they don't feel like they accomplish anything unless it's really taken a lot of multiple complicated layering steps, you know, sending letters here, letters there, sticking their thumbprint, which is ridiculous on stuff all over the place. I mean, and put a stamp on it. Now, your real cure, or if you want to call it remedy, go ahead. Your real cure is going to be found to be very simplistic. It's not going to be a whole bunch of complicated stuff. Now, if there's things that have already been done and there's contracts people have already entered into, then yes, you probably may have some complicated steps that you have to go through, some hoops you have to jump through, you know, in order to get accomplished what you're seeking to get accomplished. But on the onset, in the beginning of a situation, such as the purchase of property, the steps can be very simple. And that's what you want to look for. Look for the simple stuff. Look for the things that make sense. Look for the things that have been done and that are tried and true and tested and the things that work. It's pretty much that easy. Well, that's all I wanted to leave people with this evening. It was just that thought, something to kind of ponder in your head. And you can roll that idea over into other types of purchases that you may think about. You know, don't stop there. Think outside the box. Think about other things. If there is anybody here with us that had anything they want to bring up or ask, feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, I think I will just call this an evening. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, 
Indeed, they are uh, patents everywhere. I think where I am, though, they are the grant. But I'm in New England. I think they were from the crown from the 1600s. Um, but yeah, I mean, everywhere else, they're, they're land patents. Pretty sure. Yeah, the, the majority of property in the USA was granted to people through um, patents or grants, you know, grants specifically really from the king. The people that came here, that, that settled here, you know, the people think about slavery really getting pointed out. Uh, during, say, the 1860s with Abraham Lincoln, well, everybody that came here and settled in the USA came as slaves. They came as indentured servants. And they had to pay for that voyage to get over here, and they had to do something to pay for uh, the land that they were settling on. And when the, within those grants from the king, they had seven years to maintain the property, start yielding a profit, yield a crop from that property. And at the end of seven years, uh, they could either continue their indentured servitude or pay their way out of it. Uh, they would have uh, several different uh, conditions that were listed in their contract. And a lot of people don't know that. They don't realize that. Right. We were commodity bond servants, right? I mean, we're yeah. not we, but they were. Yeah, commodity bond servants and... This is the way this has existed you know, pretty much since the beginning of time. You know, is that slavery is nothing new. It's oldest profession is being a slave. Some people won't say it's prostitution. Well, that, that's just an added layer of servitude. <laughs> so um, also, Brian, if there's a warrant on your house, they can arrest the house, right? Is that why they call it warranty deed? Well, no, I mean, because there's, there's a lot of different types of warrants. I mean, uh, a warranty is also something that you have on a product that you purchase as well, you know, as far as how long the manufacturer guarantees it'll last and things like that. But, yeah, that is an interesting way of looking at it, though. Okay, because I heard if you pull the warranty deed at the county records, you're you're kind of cleaning yourself out, you know, but I don't know for sure. Right. You know, and, and warranty deeds are actually pretty popular. I think majority of people get warranty deeds on their property. Okay. So there were, maybe file a counter deed, you know, where you accept and acknowledge the property is, is yours, true, true owner. You know, I haven't done it, though. Well, why not do it much more easier and don't file the deed at all? Okay. You know what I mean? And if, if somebody's, like I say, think outside the box. Okay. So, for instance, if you're sitting on property that has maybe been family property or you've owned it for 10, 20 years, something like that, and the, the deed's already been filed, you've been paying taxes on it, and it's like, gosh, what do I do now? Well, it's, like I say, you got to think outside the box a little bit. Um, find someone that you, definitely trust um, and you don't even have to totally release the property you can put yourself as a co-owner but sell it sell it to somebody else you know and if you want you know put up a double wall of protection when you sell it to somebody else sell it to them in gold and silver and let them sit on it for six months or, or a year and have them sell it back to you for gold and silver and don't record the deed either of those times Hmm. Simple and effective. Yeah. I said, you just got to think outside the box a little bit on stuff. And uh, you can even take that step also. I mean, if you have vehicles that are paid off, do the same thing there. You know what I mean? Do the same thing there. And sometimes you just have to stop and, and ponder you know, different ways. It's, like I say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. You know, it's more than one way to get things done. We just have to use our imagination a little bit. You know, like, like I've said to you before, John, you know, like uh, say, for instance, somebody says, oh, you can't come in here unless you've had, you know, the Jabberwocky. Well, if they're not requiring you to get it, 
They're just requiring you to show the piece of paper. That's it. That's right. And 99% of the time, that's all any of these people are asking for is just a piece of paper. So make that piece of paper and show it to them. Yep, that's all. That's all they need. And of course, they prefer their own forms to you know to to be to get recognized in their system. But as it turns out, it doesn't have to be their forms. All right. I mean, I remember our Department of Motor Vehicles um, wanted from me that they wanted two pieces of mail that I receive on a regular basis, such as bills or something like that. But I don't even have a mailbox. So they're not going to have anything, and, I, and I'm not putting anything out there that has um, anything that points to my exact location. All right, you know. So I thought, well, okay. Well, well what would they believe? Well, how about a letter from the IRS? And so you just go and put whatever address that you want to be using. On a piece of paper that shows through the window on that letter from the IRS, and do they even open it up and exit? No, they just look down. Oh, a letter from the IRS. Oh, here's an address in the window to you. Oh, yep, this must be legit. You know, they, they just want to see a piece of paper. You got to remember, these people. A lot of people get nervous and stuff, and they deal with a lot of these different so-called officials or agents or whatever. They don't realize these people are no different than you and I regular American people they, the majority of them just want to get to work as late as possible do as little as possible while they're there and leave as early as possible and during that time they're thinking about the laundry they got to throw in the dryer when they get home and what they're going to have for dinner with the, whether or not they need to stop by the store on the way home from work you know the same things going on through their mind as we do they're not sitting there behind the desk like James Bond you know, uh, looking for any little flaw in your info so they can pounce on you. That's just not how it works. Yeah, they're just compartmentalized, and they most of them want to stay that way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they don't want to know. Anybody that's smart <clears throat> at an occupation knows that the little they know about that occupation, the better off they are. And I mean, it's just the same rings true in, in life. You know, the same things even in scripture that you're responsible for your knowledge. You know, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is a sin, right? Well, th that transfers to our regular life as well. And so as little as we know about things that are happening in our immediate vicinity, the better it is. Because you know too much about what's going on and you're going to immediately be thought of as uh, being a participant in whatever fraud that might be existing yeah they just don't want to accept responsibility either you know the system right. scared them so much i mean people are afraid to even open their mail yeah and, and that's the sad thing is that they'd rather stick their hand their head in the sand I mean, especially when it comes to, uh, say, maybe defaults on mortgages or things like that. Or even, like I said, a letter from the IRS. They, they'd rather not open the envelope, stick their head in the sand, and, you know, pretend it'll go away. You know, if they if they don't see it, then, you know, it won't be going through their mind. Ugh, terrible system we're in. Wow. Uh, well, and the, the, the problem is, uh, and like I say, because couple of vehicles I drive are police interceptors and you know, people freak out when they see the car. I don't know how many people come up to me and they're like, oh my gosh, I thought that was the police behind me. Blah, blah. And it's like, you know, you know that you are in a failed society when people are living in fear. If people have been conditioned to be in fear, it is definitely a failed society because we are not supposed to be living in fear. And the Bible says, fear not, 365 times, one for every day of the year, right? Right. That's the way it should be. All right, John, I'm taking right. off. Thanks for yep. being here, everybody. We'll catch you guys later next Sunday night, 9 o'clock Eastern. And uh, join us at Tactical Sovereignty on Facebook. Uh, join the YouTube channel. Um, 
like and share the WordPress page. There's tons of info on both of those sites. Thanks, guys. You have a wonderful evening, and we'll talk to you all later. Thanks, bud. Good night.